very fortunate to have Jeff here as a colleague at Dartmouth, and we're very fortunate to have him here uh, as a keynote speaker today. So please help me welcome to the conference. Well, thank you very much, uh, Matt and uh, Jeremy and Luke, for inviting me uh, to give this, uh, I wouldn't say keynote talk, but at least to, to start us off with uh, the theme of cognitive maps. Um, and I thought what I'd like to do today is uh, sort of give you sort of a two-part talk. Um, the first part, I know a lot of you aren't uh, neurophysiologists, um, you know, studying with rodents, but rather study a lot with humans using fMRI. And so the first part of the talk, I'm going to get, sort of give you a little bit of an introduction, um, sort of bring you up to speed, so to speak. Um, and that will become a little bit clear in a few minutes. And then the second part of the talk I'll talk about, as Matt referred to, uh, head direction cells and why I think they're important. Okay? And feel free to interrupt uh, if you have any questions or if, nothing is, uh, if something is unclear or whatever. And I thought I'd just sort of start off by just a real general slide of why is spatial maps or spatial cognition even important. Um, it's it's an it's a ability that we often take for granted. Um, but it, it's like once it goes awry in an individual, you obviously immediately become aware that something is wrong. You need to know where you are, what direction you're facing in order to find food or water, find safe places like this chipmunk with the hole here in the ground, or for that matter, you know, for animals that live in solitary uh, types of environments, you need to be able to, you know, find mates, all right? So your ability to navigate is very, very, uh, is, okay. yeah, is very important. And it's not only important for animals, but it's also important for humans as well. Uh, you need to find a watering hole uh, at the end of the day. Uh, you need to find safe places if there's something, some danger lurking about, and of course you need to know where to go to find mates in the lower right, okay? Hopefully that's within the realm of okay conduct. <laughs> um, okay, so you, you could start off by asking what are the neural mechanisms underlying our abilities to uh, orientate as well as to navigate, and you can start by asking what are the building blocks in the brain? What are the cells there doing, all right? Um, and for that, what I thought I would do is sort of, sort of go around the horn, so to speak, and sort of introduce you to all the different types of spatial cells that have been sort of identified over the past few decades. Um, so here, we, we're starting here with the neural substrates of orientation, which are often, as I said, studied at the, at the single neuron level. Um, and these techniques will actually go back to about 1970, when it was first became um, able to base, basically record from single neurons in the brain in a freely behaving animal. As we move forward into the 1990s, things, techniques got a little bit more complicated and uh, we now record from t types of electrodes that are called tetrodes, which are basically bundles of four electrodes that allow us to basically isolate and discriminate individual neurons a lot easier. And nowadays people are recording from multiple tetrodes, David Reddish, there's David. David will talk in a, tomorrow, and David, you know, records from multiple tetrodes. He records from 100 to 200 neurons simultaneously at a time, um, and allows us obviously to get a, a better insight into what the neurons are doing. Nowadays, there's been different types of techniques that have come online called silicon probes, as well as more recently something called neuropixels. I won't go into great detail, but as I have up there, the neuropixels has about 384 channels. And it, you know, we're now getting in the order of you know, recording thousands of, of neurons sim simultaneously, individual neurons. All right? So basically, um, that's what I'm going to be talking about, is basically how individual neurons uh, are tuned to different spatial correlates in the world. Right? And here's sort of an overview slide that just sort of tells you the different types of, of spatial cells that have identified over the years. And the four principal ones are shown up here, place cells, head direction cells, grid cells, and border cells. And you can see the dates at which they were first identified. Um, and then down here we have, since that time, we've sort of identified other spatial cell types that I'll go over. Some are called conjunctive cells that combine place and head direction, or grid and head direction. We also have pitch cells, angular head velocity cells, speed cells, and egocentric cells. And I'll go over each of these individually as a way of 
introducing you to basically the, the basic building blocks in the brain. So the first spatial cell type that was really identified were place cells. Um, and here we up at the top here, uh, we have four sort of top-down views looking at a cylinder where an animal happens to be just roaming around uh, looking for some food pellets or something. And while we're you know, monitoring uh, the animal moving around, we're also recording from an individual cell. And back in the early 1970s, this person here, John O'Keefe, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, sort of discovered basically these place cells. And place cells are nothing more than cells that fire on a particular location where the animal is. So one cell might fire, let's say, where I'm standing, and I walk away from the spot, the cell shuts off. I walk back over here, the cell fires again. Another cell adjacent might fire to this spot. A third cell might be in that corner. A fourth cell might fire in the back of the room, et cetera. And basically, the population of these cells basically maps out the environment of, of the rat. So these are four typical play cells that you might see. You can see this one fired in the lower left. This cell sort of fired up at the top. This was on the left, and that was in, up in the upper right. All right? And that sort of led, uh, again, this was discovered back in the early 1970s. These cells were found in the hippocampus. All right? uh, but they can also be seen in the subiculum, as well as the entorhinal cortex. And this, plus a lot of different behavioral studies that have sort of been done at the time, sort of led O'Keefe and Lynn Nadell on the far right to lead to the notion of, of or the, the concept of the cognitive map, which was basically an internal representation of the of a map of the, the spatial map of the environment that's sort of represented within the brain. Okay, this, I don't think we have any vestibular people here, but the vestibular field often uses the term rather the cognitive map. They use the term an internal model, internal model of basically a representation of the outside world. So that's place cells. Um, and then in the 1980s, uh, if you think about, you know, if you want to navigate from here, let's say, over to Moore Hall or something, the first thing you're going to have to do is ask yourself where you are, all right? And presumably, you know that you're here in the Hanover Inn, so you know your location. But of course, you're going to have to know, want to know which direction you're going to want to go. And place cells don't really encode or provide you that much information regarding directional heading. And for that, you need a second type of cell, which are called head direction cells, in order to provide information about what direction your head is facing. And this, this, uh, these cells were discovered in 1984 by my postdoc mentor, probably before many of you were actually born, <laughs> over here, Jim Rock. All right. Now, I had a little mishap this morning. Uh, I woke up and my computer was dead. And as a consequence, I'm not going to be able to show you the video that I had here of, of a head direction cell. So I'm going to have to sort of generally explain to you what a head direction cell does. All right. So here we had, this is what the very first slide of the, the video was. So we have a rat. And let's say the rat's facing this direction. So a cell that's maybe tuned to this particular direction, and I believe this is west. Um, so this cell will fire whenever the rat's head is pointing west. So right now, the cell, let's say, if you're recording from my west cell, the cell would be on. If I turn like this, the cell would be off. If I turn back here, again, it would be on. And I could do the same thing over here at a different location. So if I was over here, all right, again, I'm facing west, my head, the cell is on. I go like this, the cell is off, and the cell will remain off, again, until I put, turn my head and I'm facing west, all right? So that was a west-tuned cell. Different head direction cells are tuned to different areas within the environment. So some might be tuned to southwest, some might be tuned to south, some are going to be tuned to north, et cetera. And the population of cells, of these cells, basically represents all 360 degrees within the environment. So those are head direction cells. And if you'd seen the little video, it'd be, easy, it'd be easier for me to just go over these properties, which basically is the direction of the animal's head and not its body position. So again, if you're recording from a west cell, the animal could be facing like this here. And then if it turns its head, so its head is facing west, even though its body is facing a different direction, the cell will fire. So it's just based really on the direction of the head. Similarly, if I'm like this and the cell is firing, and I turn my head over here to look that direction, the cell will shut off even though my body is facing in the proper direction. So the cell is totally dependent on just the the directional heading of the animal. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, so what if the, you know, the rat or the person thinks they're facing 
west with the cell fire? What if they think they're facing west? Like, right, they, they assume that this is west, but yep. maybe it's north. So, yes, if, if you think you're facing west, west cell will fire, even though you could be wrong. And in terms of people who study disorientation, we often uh, refer to that as misorientation. So it's like, you know, I, th I think I'm facing west now, even though I'm not. And even though I think I, because I think I'm facing west, the west cell will fire here. And if all of a sudden you see the landmarks or whatever, and you realize that west is really over there, and I'm still facing here, the cell will shut off, and again, it will turn on when you, you face west. Good question. Yep. Does intended direction of motion or heading matter? Because suppose the, you, you, you're, you're looking this direction, but you really want to look over here, and your covert attention is in this direction. Uh, yeah, so if your covert attention goes someplace else, and you're still looking that direction, um, I, it's a little bit harder to study with that in, in rodents. Um, my guess, um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head here. Um, I, I, I can ask my fellow colleague here. I mean, I think the cell would still fire if the animal was facing west. It's, it's not really where the animal's attention might, might be. I don't, do you want to weigh in on that? Or even Dave Reddish, who's recorded head direction cells? <laughs> I mean, there's a phenomenon of anticipating future head direction, but it's not really been yeah. shown to relate to attention per yeah. se, and I think that's for the reason that you mentioned that it's yeah. just been hard to study that in rodents. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we have, I don't know of any data that's been able to, to, to address to that. Attention. Yeah, yeah. And, and these are not the areas that the primate people find attention data in. That's right. So I, I, I would oh, suspect that the navigation of attention may be different in the rodents. Jeremy? Yeah. Since, uh, Yeah. Um, so, did you hear the question in the back? Just, or do you want me to repeat? You did. Okay. Um, that hasn't been looked. Well, it's been looked at sort of tangentially. So, like in primates, there's been a few studies with head direction cells in primates, and they look to see whether eye movements make play a role. And the answer is generally no. So, it's really not where the monkey is gazing, so to speak, but it's really where the, the head direction is, you know, is directing toward. I think those exper the, the, the limited number of experiments I've looked at that have been, again, limited. And so it cer certainly needs to be looked at a lot better. Rats do make eye movements. They're not huge. And you know, rats have their, their eyes on their side. So they don't need to make a lot of eye movements in order to direct their attention, because they get a pretty good you know, 270 degree view or so of the world as it is. Yes, well, and I'm not going to go into it, but yes, the vestibular system is required if, for, the, for the, the firing of these cells. If you make a lesion in the vestibular system, you will lose the directional activity of these cells. But we'll, we'll get to the vestibular system in a second, although from a different point of view. Let's see. I just wanted yeah. to, given all these questions, do you remember what happens in the Zugaro paper or the Zumaro paper when they get the rats to run backwards? Does it when they what? When the rats are actually physically running backwards, what oh. happens? I thought it fired, well, off the top of my head, I thought it fired, even when the rat was running backwards. So you, you did it still head, head direction? It's still head direction, yeah. But I, I haven't looked at that for a while, so. Because my memory yeah. is that that would be the experiment I'd want to test the animal's focal attention. Yeah. My, Micah Selmo had a paper looking with the rats moving in a direction and its head facing, and, and, it, and, it, followed and it followed head direction and not the direction in which the animal was moving. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yes, we'll get to that in just a second. Yeah, you'll, you'll see all the places that, that they've been identified. Um, so again, just to, f to finish these properties, it's, it's the head direction in the horizontal plane, right, which is important because we're, th like my second half of the talk here is going to get into what happens when the rat goes in a vertical plane, and you'll see why that's important. Fires whether the animal's moving or still, so to, you, know, the, you know, as long as the head's facing west, the cell will fire. It's independent of the location, so again, if the animal's facing west, it doesn't matter if the animal's here, here, or in the back corner, you know, right? Um, each ex cell only exhibits one preferred, what we call one preferred firing direction. So west tuned cells obviously tuned to the west, and north cells tuned to the north, et cetera. 
Um, and again, if you looked across the population of cells, different cells are tuned to different directions. This is sort of a typical curve that uh, you'll see a few more of coming up, where we plot the firing rate of the cell here on the y-axis as a function of the animal's head direction on the x-axis. And here's a typical tuning curve. So this cell had a peak firing rate of about 20 spikes per second, had a range of head directions over which its firing was elevated from that of background levels of about 90 degrees or so, had a very small background firing rate. Um, and you can see this cell was tuned to about 180 degrees. And again, just to make sure everyone is on the same page here, if you were to draw a vector pointing in the direction of which the cell fires, where the rat is, right? and again, looking at a cylinder in this top-down view, you would sort of see all the vectors would be parallel. So if the rat was at that spot, it would sort of firing towards 8 o'clock, you would draw a vector. When the rat was down here, again, you would draw a vector. It was fine. All the vectors are parallel with one another. Okay? All right. Um, if I was able to show you the video, you would see that the video was like a cylinder, and there was a very prominent white piece of cardboard that we taped to the inside uh, wall of the cylinder, which acted as basically the salient or primary landmark that the animal can use to reference itself where, you know, that where it knows where it is. Just like here in town, even if you just showed up this morning, you probably are going to use our famous landmark, uh, the, you know, Baker uh, Library with its tower to sort of know where you are within Hanover. And this white piece of cardboard attached to the inside wall there acts, again, as a landmark for the animal. So people always ask, well, what happens if you rotate the landmark? And this sort of gets back to the question of being misoriented or something. And here's an experiment where the landmark starts out at the 3 o'clock position, and then we rotate it to 180 degrees, and then we rotate it back to the standard position over here at the 3 o'clock. And as you can see, the, in the black line, it starts out, here's a cell that was tuned to about 300 degrees. You rotate the card 180, you can see that the cell rotates 180 degrees, and then you rotate it, it back, and again, the cell goes back. Now, I don't have the slide here, but I should just suffice it to say, these aren't strictly visual cells, because if you turn off the light, or you get rid of that landmark, the cell will still fire in a directional manner, even if you put the rat in there. It might fire in a different direction if the animal doesn't really know, let's say, where 180 de degrees is, or let's say, I guess, 300 degrees for this cell. Um, but it, it just turning off the lights, taking the landmarks away, the cell is still going to fire in a directional manner. It's just like if you close your eyes here, you sort of maintain a sense of what direction you, you, you're still facing. So these cells will still fire in a directional manner. Yep. Um, over short periods of time, they don't become more broader. Over longer periods of time, you know, there might, you, you, can, you know, you can only keep track of what direction you're facing. You know, if you close your eyes, you can only be accurate for so long. And after which, you know, you might start firing rather than here, maybe over there. So the tuning curves will get, will get broader over time. Okay, so they follow, they follow landmarks very nicely. You asked the question of where they were. So whereas play cells have really only been identified in the hippocampus and maybe some of the surrounding hippocampal areas like the subiculum and interlinal cortex, um, head direction cells have been found in many different areas throughout the limbic system. I've listed them up there, as well as even some other areas outside of, of the limbic system. All right? Sure. traces, either anticipatory or of the past, or of the heading direction versus the facing direction. So for instance, if, something, if, if a rodent is moving backwards, but it's facing west, is it, is it that some of them might be the direction of movement, but some of them are the direction it's facing? Uh, the scale of prediction, like if I'm going to turn yeah. right in two seconds, is something uh, anticipati anticipating that? Well, some of these... The head direction cells in some of these areas are slightly anticipatory, meaning by about anywhere from, I don't know, 20 to, to 100 milliseconds. So it's not several seconds away, but just immediately about where you're about to go. 
The cells sometimes seem to be tuned just a little bit anticipatory. Matt has written a paper about that. You can talk to him later um, in more, more in depth. Okay. It's LMN. LMN, yeah. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into the circuitry. They were originally discovered here in the pre uh, or, or the dorsal pre which is often called post um, And that receives direct connections from the anterior thalamus, which receives connections from the lateral mammal. There's a nice little circuit that I wasn't going to get into. But as you go further back through this upstream, sort of through the circuit, they get more and more anticipatory. Okay, here's three typical tuning curves from, from different, uh, three different cells in different areas. So here's one in the post subiculum, here's one in the here dorsal thalamus, and here's one here in the lateral mammalian nuclei. Notice how each of them have different peak firing rates. It's not like all the ones in the lateral mammalian nuclei have high peak firing rates, um, but it just sort of gives you a flavor. It's not like all the ones, again, that are broader in the lateral mammalian nuclei, but you can find different tuning curve shapes across the different areas. Okay. And then uh, for the computational modelers in the audience, um, I should mention um, that over the last couple of decades, people have modeled head direction cells in terms of uh, computation of how the animal computes uh, and maintains its, its uh, directional firing through what's often referred to as a continuous ring attractor network, which is basically a series of neurons here. Uh, shown in green, that each one is tuned to a different direction. So this one's zero degrees, this one you know, is 15, this one is 30, et cetera. Here's 90, 180, 270. And basically, this ring attractor network is sort of connected such that cells that are sort of encoding head directions that are sort of similar are sort of have recurrent excitatory connections with one another, whereas the ones that are in the opposite direction are all inhibited. So if you're facing 90 degrees right now, the 90 degree cell would be, you know, sort of also activating the two adjacent ones to some degree, but at the same time it would be hitting, inhibiting ones in the opposite direction. And then if you have a vestibular or motor inputs that's turning the head, or visual inputs that's, you know, driving these cells, you can sort of direct or redirect uh, which uh, uh, point around the ring becomes active. Okay. Um, so that's a ring attractor network that these cells have been modeled. And if you're interested in that, you can talk to Dave Fetish, who's one of the people who first suggested this, this model. Okay, so that's, I'm already behind time here. So that's place cells, that's head direction cells. Third type of, of, of cell that was discovered in 2005 was uh, it's called the grid cells by the Mosiers. And here they are, and they joined John O'Keefe in winning the Nobel Prize again um, for this discovery. Um, and basically, over here, we're looking at a sort of uh, the black lines are um, where the sort of a trajectory field of, of where the rat's been moving, and the red dots are basically indicating wherever the cell fired. So as you look at this, if you construct a firing rate map, which is sort of this sort of middle column here for these two particular cells, you can see that they, they sort of the more red or yellowish colors are higher firing rate. And you can see that there were several, these, these grid cells fired in several different locations, all right? So this one fired at, what, about 10 different locations. This one down here fired at three different locations. And then if you construct what's often referred to as a spatial autocorrelation, and I'm not going to get into that, but you can see that these cells have a very sort of regular repeating pattern of activity in terms of where those locations are. And so because it's a very regular repeating a pattern of activity that's often referred to as a hexagon, which is shown here in white. Um, they've been called grid cells, all right? And grid cells were first reported in the medial entorhinal cortex, but are also found in the parasubiculum and presubiculum as well, okay? Um, and then, of course, different grid cells are going to be sort of tuned to slightly different locations. So these different colors here, blue, red, and green, indicate three different grid cells, and you can see that in a map that hasn't been shifted at all, each of these sort of grids are not overlapping in the sense that they're slightly offset from one another, but you can sort of line up the different maps such that they look like that they are overlapping as indicated there on the right, all right? And there's been different sort of grid patterns that have been identified. Some are sort of small grid patterns like the one shown on the bottom here. Other ones are sort of more dense grid patterns as shown by the cell up on the top, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so those are grid cells. Um, the last major type of, of cells are called border cells. Some people have called these boundary vector cells. 
And again, this is a, a firing rate map showing uh, loca the location of the, where the cell fired. And you can see this cell fired along the border, another cell, second cell fired along that border, a third cell fired along that border. So you can see these cells basically are encoding the border of the apparatus. These cells have been reported in the subiculum and medial and rhinal cortex. Okay? Um, so those are the four principal cells, place cells, head direction cells, grid cells, and border cells. You can also get what we are often referred to as conjunctive cells. And these are cells that sort of map two different spatial properties. So for instance, you can have a, a conjunctive cell that's mapping both place and head direction. So here you can see this cell here, cell one, is mapping that particular place. And on a pole plot, plotted here, you can see that this cell also fired in this direction, pointing down. I don't know which direction that was in that environment. Um, maybe it was sort of down there, doesn't matter. Cell two here, you can see fired at the lower left, and again, it had a, was also tuned to a particular direction. So these are cells that are conjunctive in terms of combining two different spatial properties. Here's another conjunctive type of cell. This is a conjunctive grid plus head direction. So again, a nice head direction, or a nice grid cell here, and you can see over here in this gray, whoops, this gray graph over here, a nice tuning curve um, as well. So this cell is coding, again, two spatial properties, grid plus, plus head direction. Yes. So it would only fire, you know, basically in, in, in all the places where you, well, in, where you see the red, red, red pixels there. But the rat would also have to be facing that particular direction. So it's combining both, both, both spatial properties. Well, the fire rate isn't zero outside of the preferred head direction. That's true. So it's yeah. strictly, it must be true. Yeah. Um, yep. No, it stays conjunctive the whole time. Yeah, he he asked if if it if it the, the the conjunctiveness changes over time, and the answer is no. Uh, are these like? Do you think of these as it's like a grid cell plus a head direction cell feed into some conjunctive cell, or is it truly like the primary building block is the conjunction? Or can you distinguish? Those? Well, you can get grid cells that are not conjunctive with yeah. head direction. That's right. So these are all, I mean, how they're all wired up and which, who's talking to who is a little bit less clear, not as well understood. Okay? So is the right part the same cell but outside the direction? Or is what? The, the one, the second from the left, is that? So this, this is the firing rate map. So this is plotting firing rate, color-coded, as a function of the position or location of the animal. This one over here is a spatial, what's called a spatial autocorrelation. It would take me five minutes to go through. It's, it's taking this map and spatially autocorrelating it with itself as it moves in different directions. It's, the reason why they do this is just easier often to see the grid pattern. Okay. Yep. No, it's, it's fundamentally different. I, I, I wish I had that video to play for you, but you would see that the cell I had fired at 80 spikes per second, and it only fired 80 per second, you know, spikes per second when the animal's facing this way. And the animal walks all over the place, and it, whenever the animal's head's facing that direction, it fires. So it's independent of, of grid, basically. Yeah. Is there tracing that shows they have different connectivity? It is, pardon me? Um, well, it, it, uh, so you do find head direction cells in the medial and rhinal cortex where you also find the grid cells. And the extent to which they have different connectivity, we don't know, at least, at least on, a fine, on a fine level. Yeah. Do you agree? Okay. <laughs> 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 <It's> not, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> All right, so those are the four principal t t types. I showed you some conjunctive ones. I'm, gonna, so I'm losing uh, some time here, so I'm going to try to speed things up a little bit to get through all these different other spatial cell types that, that have been identified over the past couple of decades. So these are angular head velocity cells. 
All they're tuning to, or encoding is basically how fast you are turning your head, either clockwise or counterclockwise. All right. Um, up at the top, they come in different. Th these were typically seen most often in some of these brainstem nuclei. Some of them are sort of uh, are symmetric. So if you plot as a function of either clockwise angular head velocity here or counterclockwise angular head velocity on the right, you can see that this cell f fired fa the faster or at a higher fire rate, the faster the animal was turning either counterclockwise or clockwise. Here's another sample uh, cell over there on the right. There are other angular head velocity cells that we term asymmetric, and you can see their tuning curves look much more asymmetrical. So in other words, this cell fired the more, the higher the fire, the more the animal was turning counterclockwise, and its firing rate decreased the more the animal was turning clockwise. Here's another one that was only tuned in one particular direction, in this case clockwise, and in the other direction counterclockwise, its firing rate wasn't modulated at all. So those are angular head velocity cells. You can also find pitch cells, which basically are encoding basically the pitch of the animal, like this. So if you're plotting head pitch from zero up to 90 degrees looking straight up as a function of firing rate, here's a pitch cell that sort of starts out sort of pretty much is with the animal's head level. It, it doesn't fire very much. But once you get above 45 degrees, there's a very linear increase in the cell's firing rate. Here's one that was a little bit more linear over the entire extent of head pitch. Um, you can also find what's called speed cells, which is basically how fast the animal is moving in a, in a linear direction. These are found, these were first identified about 50 years ago now by Pat Sharp in the Habenula. And here's some examples. Again, we are plotting running speed on the x axis as a function of firing rate. Here are three di different um, speed cells in the Habenula or the interpeduncular nucleus. And more recently, the Mosier Lab, just a few years ago, identified speed cells in the medial and hormonal cortex. Again, plotting you know, uh, the running speed on the x-axis as a function of firing rate. And then finally, you get what's called egocentric cells. All right? Now, egocentric cells were first discussed in the parietal cortex about five years ago by uh, Aaron Wilbur and Ben Clark from Bruce McNaughton's lab. Um, and these cells are a little bit different than the cells that we've been talking about so far. A lot of the cells we've been talking about so far are, are said to be allocentric in the sense that they use um, the earth or the outside world as the reference frame. These cells, in contrast, use the rat, egocentric, as, or itself as, as the reference frame. And uh, rather than explain this one, let me just go through these a little bit more detail. So it's, this is sort of sunny egocentric cells have become quite fashionable this, this past year. Uh, there's been four articles, at least four articles that have come out talking about these cell types in either the lateral and the cortex in Jim Knieren's lab, the dorsal medial striatum, and in Mike Asemo's lab, and the post rhino cortex um, in Der Dickman's and Mosier's lab. Uh, that, this paper actually just came out uh, just about a week ago. Our lab has also studied egocentric cells, and we had this paper come out about a month ago now. Um, and these egocentric cells were discovered in what, an area of the brain that's referred to as the post rhinal cortex, which is part of the parahippocampal cortex. It's part of the tissue that sort of overlies uh, the hippocampus. All right. Now, Patrick uh, from our lab, um, to record these egocentric cells, he was recording from post rhinal cortex, and he basically identified three different cell types there, two of which are of these egocentric type, these top two. One was called center bearing, and the middle one is called center distance, all right? And, this, and then he also, the third type of, that he showed was head direction cells, just like I told you. Now, in order to stay on these egocentric cells, you have to sort of understand how uh, we are sort of going to define where the animal is in space. So here's our little triangle. Here's a picture of the rat facing sort of up to the upper right, all right? And here's zero degrees. And we can, find, can define the head direction that the rat is facing, basically relative to the external world. Right? So that would be this arrow pointing up here. And then we can also define the direction that the rat is facing, this blue arrow, relative to the center of the environment. Right? So you can see that this blue arrow is basically just drawing the angle between the rat's sort of 
longitudinal directional heading as uh, over to the center of the environment, all right? And we can measure that as, a, as the egocentric angle of, of the rat, okay? We can also talk about the distance the rat is away from the center of the apparatus as shown by that green bar. Okay, so here you might say, what is an egocentric center-bearing cell? And I've shown you here three different examples, all right? And again, the vector represents where the rat might be and the direction it's facing when the cell fires. So here, over here on the left, we have what's called a 0, 360, or facing towards the center cell. This cell will fire wherever the rat is, whenever it's basically facing its head towards the center of the apparatus. Over here in the middle, we have just sort of the opposite. It's still a center-bearing cell, but now the firing rate is firing most robustly when the animal is facing away from the center. So all the, the vectors are facing away. Over here, in this sort of uh, concentric circle one, we have a cell, an egocentric bearing cell that fires whenever the rat's, let's say, left side is facing towards the center of the apparatus. So down here, of course, its left side would be facing towards the center. Over here, again, the left side is facing towards the center, etc. So these, it's, it's sort of basically where the rat is relative to the center of the environment. Do you have a question? What would happen in an asymmetric environment? What would happen in an asymmetric environment? What would, uh, <laughs> where's Patrick? Patrick wants to study that. You want to? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's sort of one of the things that we've been, we've been wanting to, to do, actually, to look at an asymmetric, like a trapezoid or something like that. Yep. Um, is there a version where you have a goal or reward somewhere in the environment, and then would there be things that are you know, orbiting the reward or towards or away from So the these cells were recorded, for the most part, with nothing in the environment. There was one manipulation we, that Patrick did where there was an object in there. But for the most part, you will see these without any objects what in there. Yeah, I th uh, well, for the ones in post rhinal cortex, it didn't matter whether there, there was an object in there or not. They still fired in this way. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you put the object in, it, 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 it still fired in, in this manner. Yeah, so we yeah. had a different configuration of thought for us. Than, um, they but didn't none really of them was rewarding, right? What? None of them was rewarding. No, no, they didn't yeah. have any kind of behavioral failure. So gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you're asking a why question here, and it's, it's a little bit hard to, I, you know, it's, it's like presume in this room you're encoding where the center of the room is. I, it's, it's, it's just might be how the brain encodes the space. I mean, the, um, the paper that... Competition, I was wondering. Competition? Computation. Oh, computation. I was whether it's because of the graph property of that location, but that's... Yeah, I, some of this, the paper that just came out by Jared Dickman talked more about the boundaries of the environment, that the cells were egocentric, but rather relative to the center, they were relative more to, to the boundary. So you get slightly different flavors, okay? Um, and again, just to show you the difference between these egocentric cells up here in the top row and the head direction cell, of course, with the head direction cell, all the vectors are pointing in the same direction. Um, okay, so in addition, oh yeah, so if you were to, well, let's, Let's not worry about the color-coded one. So if you were to graph these center-bearing cells, they look like head direction cells, but now rather than plotting head direction, we're plotting the center bearing, you know, the degree, the angle between the animal's directional heading and the center of the environment. And if you look at the firing rate of the cell, again, as a function of the center bearing angle, you can see that it looks the cell was tuned basically to, to around 0 to 360, which was facing towards the center. Here's one that's tuned to 180, which again would be facing away from the center. And if you looked at different cells, you get a, I wouldn't say you get an even distribution, but you do get cells that are basically sort of oriented in different relationships to the center of the environment, okay? Um, so for instance, the, let me just, this cell here, this 90 degree cell here that you're seeing would be one of these cells down here in the 90 degree category. So that's an egocentric center bearing cell. You also get e egocentric center distance cells where basically the firing rate is, is, is uh, basically re is related to how far the animal is away from the center of the environment. Some cells like this one shown here are basically fire maximally 
the closer the amyl is to the center of the environment. Well, other center, uh, other center distance cells are going to fire most robustly when the animal is the furthest away from the center of the environment and along the boundary, such as over here. Okay. So those are center distance cells, again, egocentric. You can also get conjunctive egocentric cells. And here is a cell that is basically shows some center bearing. It also is tuned nicely to center distance, and it's also tuned to head direction. So this is basically conjunctive between all three properties. All right, and to bring everything home here together, you can think of the combination of these three signals, the center bearing, the center distance, and an allocentric head direction cell here. Basically, all of this type of information is funneling in and gives you a very precise code of where you are in the environment as well as what direction your head is facing. Okay? All right, that's the end of the introduction. It's almost <laughs> the end of my talk. <laughs> All right, um, so let's see uh, what we can do here. So what I'm going to want to talk about now is, is talk a little bit uh, what we've been doing recently in terms of how head direction cells fire in three dimensions. Um, and so far, everything I've told you with the head direction cell firing has been here within the horizontal plane. But you can sort of ask the question, how is the horizontal frame defined? All right. How do head direction cells respond when an animal climbs up a wall, or even goes inverted, for that matter, during locomotion? And you might say, why does this even matter? All right? There's lots of reasons, but one of the more colorful reasons is that the astronauts, when they go up in space on the space station or whatever, they experience a whole bunch of different types of disorientation problems, as well as illusions in space. And they're very, very disoriented up there. The astronauts often have different types of illusions, some of which are called visual reorientation illusions, or VRIs, inversion illusions, or extravehicular activity, acrophobia. So to just go through these briefly, a VRI is sort of like you're standing there on the spaceship or in the, on the, in the space lab, and you look down, and you think you're upright, and you might see your colleague like this. Now, normally, you don't see people sort of situated with their feet on their ceiling and head on the ground. So you immediately think, ah, this must be the floor, and that's really the ceiling, and I must be upside down. So the, the, the astronaut immediately f feels like they're flipped upside down, even though they may really not, might not be. That's what's often referred to as a visual reorientation illusion. And you can also often flip back and forth thinking what is up and what is down. All right? uh, it's sort of like this famous Necker cube here. If you look at the Necker cube and you just stare at it, you can ask the question, is it opening up towards you or away from you? It's opening up. I mean, you, usually, you look, I look at it initially. It looks like it's opening up towards me. But if you stare at it long enough, it will look like it's opening up away. And if you keep staring at it, you'll flip back and forth between those two different um, interpretations. And that's exactly the way these visual reorientations sort of work when you're up in space. You feel like you're right side up. And then you might see someone who's upside down. You go, oh, I'm upside down. It's like a very immediate sort of perception. Um, visual reorientation illusions, if you think you're upside down, OK, you can usually get them. You, you can write yourself up very easily, usually by removing the visual stimulus, by just simply closing your eyes. You can usually get yourself to sense, again, where the up and down are. All right? In contrast with an inversion illusion, which is thought to be due more to probably to uh, what's often referred to as vestibular unweighting, is a, a more permanent feeling that you're upside down. All right? With an inversion illusion, it's like you feel like you're upside down, but if you close your eyes and get rid of the visual scene, you still feel upside down. And it, it's often very, very debilitating, such that the astronauts usually often need to just go back to their little sleep sack and just sort of hide out there for several hours until they recover. Extravehicular activity, acrophobia, is sort of like this astronaut here who gets a sudden feeling that they're going to fall even though because there's nothing supporting their feet, all right? Um, and they just sort of cling on for dear life to whatever they happen to, particularly if they see the earth below them, all right? Um, so knowing your spatial orientation is, is very important. And it, it, if all sorts of consequences arise as a result of being disoriented in space, they often get space motion sickness, which is 
like car sickness or sea sickness here on Earth. They tend to flip switches in wrong directions. If you think about it, if I flip a switch, if I go like this to the right, all right, like this, I'm going to flip it towards the window. But if I just simply roll myself and I'm like upside down, and even though I'm still looking at you, and I flip a switch to the right, it's going to go in the other direction, 180 degrees opposite of what the way you want to flip the switch. And in fact, the rumor had it that there was a fire aboard one of the uh, Russian modules uh, a couple of decades ago. And rumor had it that one of the cosmonauts flipped the switch in the wrong direction. He was a little bit disoriented. So it's very important that you know how you're oriented. They have very poor spatial awareness so that if you're in a space lab like that and you need to have an emergency egress and figure out where you're going, um, they often will go in the wrong direction. If you ask them to draw a map while they're up there, again, they have a very sort of poor awareness of, of, where, of the spatial layout. Um, the last one. So those are a number of problems that they have, which makes it, again, very important to understand how these cells fire um, when the animal um, uh, is in different planes, okay, not just simply a simple horizontal reference frame. So our sort of foray into studying this goes back almost 20 years ago now to Bob Stackman, who asked the question, how does these cells fire when the rat, these head direction cells fire when the rat is on a wall? So here's a top-down view of the cylinder where there's uh, a mesh. This is the floor here. This is an annulus that goes around the top. Here's a sort of a side view. And so the rat simply starts out here on the floor, runs up the ladder and up here to the top, around the top, and then it runs back down the ladder to the floor. So you can basically um, put this sort of mesh ladder at different positions depending upon the preferred firing direction of the cell that you happen to be cording from. So here's a cell that in this case is tuned sort of down, all right, when it's on the floor, or at least looking south as you're looking at it. And so we can sort of define the mesh at the zero degree position as the, as the position where the cell sort of likes to fire in that direction, whereas 180 degrees, the mesh would be the opposite direction for where the cell likes to fire. And then of course, we have the 90 and 270 degree positions on, on the side. All right, so what happens when the animal climbs up the mesh? So here's an animal climbing up the mesh. Here it is up at the top. Here it is climbing down, all right? And you can see that we're monitoring the cells with the cable coming down. So when the mesh is at in the direction that the cell likes to fire, the zero degree position as is shown here, the cell fires when the animal goes up, the red line, but when the animal runs down the mesh, it doesn't fire at all. Okay. When the mesh is at the 180 degree position, just on the opposite side here, you can see it doesn't, the cell doesn't fire at all, the red line, when an animal goes up the mesh, but it fires when the animal comes down the mesh. Right? And at the 90 or the 270 degrees position, you can see it doesn't fire at all when going up or down. All right? So how do we explain this? All right? So here we have Basically, let's, let's take our west tuned cell again that's firing in this direction. You can imagine if you were recording in this room, the cell would fire if I ran up that wall, but not when I ran down that wall. Now, when I ran down that wall, I'd be at the top of the wall, and I would, of course, be facing this way to run down, which is in the off direction. So the cell starts off because I'm facing in the off direction, and then I run down, so it remains off. Just the opposite, of course, happens on this wall. Again, if the cell is tuned to this direction, now I'm facing away from it, so the cell's off. So as I approach this wall here and I run up, the cell remains off. But when I'm on top and I'm going to run down, I'm now facing again the direction that the cell is tuned. So when I run down, it remains on when I run down, right? Um, and of course, if that's the direction, if I go up or down this wall, I'm never really facing that direction, so it doesn't fire on either of the two side walls, okay? Um, yeah, uh, to <laughs> I'm trying to think where I can skip a few slides here um, to try to pick up some time. So here's another same, same experiment, but we wanted to look a little bit more fully to all the directions on each of the different walls. So we had an apparatus like this where the ammo would sort of basically run this spiral. On each of the, and you, as you can see, this whole thing is on wheels. So I could position this spiral on the back wall, 
I can position the spiral here, here, or, or over there. I can position it basically on any of the four walls right, and monitor what the cell is doing in this vertical plane. Right? Is this in the hallway of our basement? Uh, that was where the picture was taken, uh, just to take the picture. That wasn't, that wasn't where we were recording the rap. Notice how there's no recording cable on it. On it. Uh, it's just this. Yeah, just details. Um, so there were, there were two ways that we ran the experiment. You know, either the animal was just placed here at the start, like that, just simply picked up and placed, or the animal was allowed to sort of run around this little box, and then it ran up the ramp onto the spiral, all right? It, there was a little food reward here at the finish, so the animal was motivated to, to basically run the spiral. And as I said, you can position basically this, this, um, this apparatus, the vertical platform, in any of the four different cardinal positions in the room, all right? How did the cell fire? Well, the cell fired depending upon which of these two types of configurations you gave it, all right? If you gave it configuration number one, where you simply picked up the animal and you just put it here, or you put it over there, right? The animal tended to use the vertical platform as the reference frame. So if the cell, let's say, liked to fire in the upper left, it would always would fire, you know, let's say, as the animal sort of was right, right there facing the upper left as it ran the spiral. And it didn't matter whether that platform was over here, over there, or over there. It always fired at that particular place. Um, on the apparatus. And so that's actually what's shown here in the sense that all the tuning curves of these cells all overlap no matter where that apparatus was positioned, all right? But if you were to plot it in room coordinates, you can see it fired in different place in room, in room coordinates, all right? On the other hand, if you ran the experiment such that the animal was in this box on the floor and then allowed it to run, you can see then the animal didn't use the, the platform coordinates as indicated by the messy tuning curves here, but all of the coordinates lined up, or all the tuning curves lined up when the animal was basically using the coordinates within the room, all right? All right, so that led basically to the following, all right? And this is important, and this is became known as the rotational plane hypothesis. And here we have it so that whatever the firing rate is on the floor, all right, you could account or explain how the cell would fire on the walls by just simply rotating the floor up to the particular vertical plane. So if the cell is a west cell pointing that way, to explain how it would fire on this wall, you just simply rotate the floor up to this wall. And if we have a vector pointing in this direction, you rotate it up to this wall, it would fire when the animal is on this wall facing that direction. Same thing over there. And again, to account for this wall, if, it, if it's facing this way, you just simply rotate the floor up to this wall, and of course the vector would be facing down. So it was the rotational plane hypothesis. You're simply, simply just rotating the plane that the animal is in on the floor up to the appropriate vertical. All right. One little caveat before I get to the last important set of experiments. The rotational plane hypothesis worked very nicely for anything between 0 to 90 degrees. Once the animal got inverted, though, all right, the cells, all the head direction cells basically lost their directional tuning. All right? And that can be seen here very easily in an experiment that was done by Jeff Kelton. When the animal starts, this is a sort of four foot by four foot ring. The animal starts out here in this little uh, end of the apparatus. It's trying to get over here to the food bowl, but there's a little partition here. So the animal has to sort of climb up this wall, go upside down here on the ceiling, down this wall over here to get to the little food bowl, right? And this whole thing sort of spun, so you could sort of spin it so that it would start out so that the rat was, that the thing was facing in the direction that, that, the, that the cell was firing in. So if the cell, let's say in this particular view, was firing to the left, it would be positioned like this. And pretty much as the animal starts out, it would fire to the left in the start box, it would fire up as the animal goes up this wall. Forget about the ceiling for a second. It would fire going down that one, and then again would return firing, uh, still firing on the floor facing the left. That would all be accounted for the rotational plane hypothesis. And when the animal goes, I should say, we were mean to the rats, so that after the rat did this here, we only gave it about 20 seconds to allow it to eat some food pellets. Then we took the bowl, put it over here. So the rat had to go back the other way, all right? And so when the rat goes back the other way, such as here, again, to the left, the cell's going to remain off the whole time, 
at least on the walls, okay? As well as on the floor when it's facing that opposite direction. So the question is, what happens when it's on the ceiling? And here you can see on the ceiling, so here's, the nice, here's two different cells. One cell, second cell. On the floor, nice tuning curve. East wall, nice tuning curve. West wall, nice tuning curve. Ceiling, no tuning at all. Okay. Second cell. Over here is the floor, east wall, west wall, nice tuning, ceiling, no tuning. So something about being inverted sort of upsets these cells, and they lose their directional firing. All right. Last little project here. All of that was fine and dandy up until about a year or two ago when um, Kate Jeffrey over in University College in London sort of started recording animals on sort of, rather than on the walls like we did, they recorded it on a sort of like a little cuboidal type of, of, uh, of object such as shown here. So the animal would start out here in the box and then would sort of climb around. She often referred to it as like a tree stump in the sense that it would go around the different sides. It would sort of have chicken wire on the side, all right? And she pointed out uh, and what, what motivated her for this was, was often what was known as the Berry phase problem. If I ask you to point north here, so this is north towards Baker Tower, and you're pointing like that, and if you kept walking north all the way to the North Pole, you would always would be pointing north, right? Now someone over in London who does the same thing, if they point north, all right, and they walk towards the North Pole, they're always going to be pointing north too. But when the two of you and, and, and if you asked the person, you called up the person here in London on your cell phone and sort of say, you know, point north, and you both be say, yeah, I'm pointing to the North Pole, all right? Now, you both walk to the North Pole. What happens when you get up there, all right? You're going to be 90 degrees off from one another, all right? Which is, this is what's known as the Berry phase problem, okay? You each, you know, I'm going to be saying this is really north, and the other person's going to be saying this is really north, all right? And so somehow the brain has to... Um, sort of fix this, or at least address this problem, all right? Um, and the rotational plane hypothesis really doesn't address this problem. And what Kate Jeffrey came up with was a sort of, um, she came up with three different models. And again, a little bit for the sake of time, I'll sort of go through this quickly. She had three different types of ways that the animal could use a reference frame. One is the platform, all right, which is I just talked to you about, like say the apparatus that you happen to be on. You could also use the room coordinates all right, the global coordinates, or you can use what's often called the dual axis model, which requires the cell's preferred firing direction to rotate when an animal goes around a vertical corner. All right. Normally, if you go, you know, if this is how the cell is firing, and then I, let's say, going up this wall, let's say, fires up, going up the lectern, and I go around over here, according to the rotational plane hypothesis, it should also fire going up this wall. But what the dual axis model predicted was that the cell should actually shift to a different direction as I go over here to the side wall and actually would rotate 90 degrees to going around a clock. It would rotate clockwise to going around a right corner and rotate counterclockwise going around a left corner. All right? And so if you, what she did was, again, using this apparatus, she recorded what the cell was doing on two opposing walls. And according to the dual axis hypothesis, the shell should fire 180 degrees apart from one another as you look at the wall. So as I'm looking at the wall here, it will fire to the left. But as I'm looking at the wall here, it's going to fire in the same direction. But it's, now that I'm looking at it, it will fire to the right. That was her prediction. All right? And that's exactly what happened here. Here's the same cell. One on the east wall, one on the west wall. And you can see that they're about 180 degrees apart. Here's the second cell doing the same thing. And if you looked at the population of cells, they're all sort of about 180 degrees apart. There. We're getting there. OK. So the last question we wanted to know is, and this gets back to the title of the talk, are head direction cells commutative? Commutative means, does the order of which you do things matter? 3 plus 4 equals 4 plus 3. So for addition, addition is commutative. All right? But it's not obviously true for division. OK? Um, so we asked. Are the head direction cells commuted? Does it matter the order of which you approach these different vertical planes? So we constructed this sort of cuboidal surface like this, all right? And we asked the question, if the animal runs the route here in blue, all right, so floor to the front wall to the top, and the arrows predicting the direction of which the cell would fire, at least 
with the cell starting out firing north here. And here, if it runs the route up this way, green like this, it's all the same direction at the top. On the other hand, if the ammo goes from the floor to the wall, front wall, over here to the side wall, and then up to the top, if you use the rotational plane hypothesis, the, shown by the red arrows, the, again, it should just sort of shift around the corner and be oriented like that. But then when you get to the top, it's going to be off by 90 degrees. The dual axis doesn't have that problem because as the animal goes around the, the 90 degree corner, vertical corner here, the cell is going to shift, in this case, 90 degrees clockwise. Going around the other corner to the left, it's going to shift 90 degrees counterclockwise. So the question is, we actually ran the experiment using an apparatus like this, and the animal could either use this direct route, floor to the front wall to the top, floor to the front wall to the side wall, so two walls up to the top, or it could either do a route that went from the floor up to the front wall to the side wall and then back around to the other side wall and up to the top, each time asking how this cell is firing. So here we have the direct route, one wall, and you can see this cell is tuned to just a little bit less than 360. So here we have the cell here on the, in the floor. Here it is um, on the front wall, and here it is up on top. Over here is the two-wall experiment where the ammo goes, again, from the floor, same, goes up the ramp to this uh, front wall. Here is in the front wall, five. It's the same as two. But then when the ammo goes around the corner, there's a 90-degree shift in the cell's preferred firing direction clockwise, as you can see here. And then when the ammo gets up to the top, it maintains that, that, um, that direction such that this direction is the same as that. If you looked at it across all the cells, again, with the indirect route, um, here going around the left wall, you get a 90-degree shift counterclockwise. Going around the right wall, you, you get a clockwise 90-degree shift. Right? And if you looked at the indirect route and you looked at the difference between the two walls, just like the Jeffrey lab did, again, the difference between the preferred firing direction averages about 180 degrees. All right, so the dual axis model really fits the data a lot better, basically, than the rotational plane hypothesis. All right? So this model incorporates information both from the external landmark reference frames, both local and global, as well as internal information from the animal's orientation relative to gravity. All right, quickly, I promise. <laughs> We've done other manipulations where we actually either rotated the apparatus or simply placed, picked up the animal and moved the animal around the corner like that. We got the same results. The cells would shift clockwise and going around the right corner, shift counterclockwise when going around the left corner. We asked, did the same thing happen in the dark? The answer was yes. We also looked at 45 degree angles, where the, this sort of sidewall was positioned 45 degree angles. And as you might expect, we'd get the same result, except now the cell doesn't shift 90 degrees. It only shifts 45 degrees. And then finally, we looked at what happens. All, everything I told you so far was about outside corners. What happened about inside corners? Well, if you think about the problem, on the inside, going around an inside vertical corner should be just the opposite as going around an outside vertical corner. And so we constructed, we set up the apparatus like this where the ammo goes up, does an inside corner here, going from plane two to plane three, and then around an outside corner going from basically plane three to plane four, and then up to the top. And everything obeyed just as it said. So the conclusions. The dual axis model seems to fit the data a lot better than the rotational plane hypothesis. The preferred direction will rotate going around vertical corners, but not horizontal corners, indicating that gravity probably plays a very important role for referencing the orientation. Right? And lastly, you can might ask the question, how does the brain distinguish when you're going around a horizontal corner, let's say going like from here up this wall, that's a horizontal corner, versus going around a vertical corner? either an outside corner or an inside corner like that. All right? And to answer that, you have to think a little bit about the vestibular system being composed of semicircular canals sensitive to the angular motion of the animal, as well as the otoliths, which is sensitive to gravity and linear acceleration. Last slide.
to, in order to distinguish between a vertical corner and a horizontal corner, one way that it might be doing it is that when the animal goes around, in this case, either in a pitch direction, as is shown here in the middle, or it might sort of, as you might do, go, go around in a roll position, rolling yourself, as indicated by here. In both of these situations here, all right, the canal signal, as you turn angularly like that, or pitching like that, okay, um, is not accompanied by a change in the odorless signal. The odorless signal is referencing the gravity hasn't changed as you, as you go around a vertical corner like this, or even if I was on my side and sort of just going around the corner like that, the, the odor, there is no change at all in the odorless signal. In contrast, if you go around a horizontal corner, in this case, you know, you just climb up the wall like that by pitching, or like it's shown here on the right, if I was to sort of go like this, going up that, in that case, the canal signal is accompanied by a change in the odorless signal. So one possibility is to distinguish between the vertical and horizontal corners in order to determine whether the cell needs to rotate its preferred fine direction, is comparing the canal signal with the odorless signal and saying if the they're both changing or only one is changing. And with that, there might be a cognitive component, as I have there uh, in blue with the question mark as well. So with that, I'll, I'll just sort of end there by just thanking Julie, Jennifer, Palin, and Patrick for help uh, in doing these 3D experiments. And for those postdocs or potential postdocs out there, we are looking for students who want to do postdocs, who want to work on these head direction cells, grid cells, and egocentric cells. And if you're interested, come see me. Thank you very much. Yeah.